everyone uh, to our fourth session. Um, today we are very lucky to have Scott Harrington with us to deliver a session on his model of 3 to one defensive system. Um, Scott will speak a bit more about himself, but I'll give some, some uh, pointers out. He's a former GB player and, and coach. Uh, he was the Faroe Islands Handball Federation head coach for the women's team, uh, as well as talent developer. Uh, he worked as assistant coach for the Chinese Handball Federation women's team. Uh, most recently, uh, head coach for Sola Handball, the Norwegian women's elite series. And he works as, as a talent coach and coach developer for the Norwegian Handball Federation. Alongside his club coaching, uh, he is creator of an international coaching camp and the Handball Academy. Um, and he's owner of his own coaching company called Harrington Handball links to both the coaching camp and uh, the YouTube channel of his coaching company will be available on the, on, the, on the email we'll send after the session and possibly Scott will post the link for the YouTube channel as well on the chat so you can have immediate access to it if you want to take a look at it and, and ask any questions concerning that as well. Um, as I said at the start, uh, Scott it's about to present a session of his proposal of a 3 to one defensive system uh, I should emphasize this is his personal uh, proposal. Uh, I'm sure we can all agree that the same system can, can have different models and methodologies. Uh, Scott is going to explore his own model and, and, and what takes part of it and how he achieves the goals in it. Uh, in terms of uh, housekeeping, as usual, the questions uh, during Scott's presentation are only allowed in the chat. Bobby's going to take care of that. He's going to be the question man today. Uh, and then after the presentation, if there's time, uh, we might allow a bit for open mic questions and live questions that you can challenge directly, Scott. So I would now uh, mute myself and allow Scott to do his thing. Ah, I forgot to say one thing. It's Scott's birthday today. Uh, so <laughs> he's doing us a, a, a huge favor and we appreciate that. So happy birthday, Scott. And now this is our gift to you. Go on. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen, everybody, before I get started. Can everyone hear me okay? Is it all right? All good, mate. Okay. Okay, real quick, can you see the screen as it should be seen, Bob Ricardo? Yeah, all good. Okay. I'm just going to move you all away. Uh, Just give me a second, guys, and set up this. I haven't disappeared. No, you're right, mate. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm just getting my um, tracking pads. I couldn't do it before uh, before I had the screen shared. So I'm just going to go ahead and share that so I have a presentation for you. Okay, almost there. Okay, and we are back. Yes, sorry about the delay. Um, yeah, thanks very much for the introduction, uh, Bob and Ricardo. Um, never say no trip back to England handball. Uh, probably not where I would have preferred this time around. Um, but obviously, this is a situation that we that we dealt with. Um, 
but uh, nonetheless, so great to come back and see, especially some familiar faces here. Um, when I was asked to come on and deliver uh, about three two one defense, obviously this is quite a a broad field, uh, three two one defense, and I did a bit of research uh, into what is already out there online, uh, what exists, um, and what I saw was. Um, a lot of high detailed um, teaching. All you have to do is look on some of the Balkan uh, YouTube channels, for example, uh, and you will see some very technical um, detailed three, two, one uh, teachings. Um, and I saw a lot of, of teaching also demonstrating with the pinnacle of elite handball. Um, so I've kind of framed my seminar today from a slightly different angle. Um, and what I'd like to do is present, uh, first and foremost, my three, two, one, um, but spend a tiny bit more emphasis, not necessarily on the tactical Scott, considerations. Scott, I'm sorry, I'm sorry for, for interrupting, but there's a lot of people saying it and, and uh, we can hear it as well. There's a lot of back noise from your mic as it was at the start. Oh, okay. Sorry. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry that's about perfect. that, guys. Just, just say it one more time if, uh, if that's the same again. Um, so I wanted to frame this argument a bit from a different perspective, I guess, um, and talk about my 3 two, one but, but mainly about how it can be implemented into youth handball uh, from start to execution, rather than go into the minor details about 3 two, one defence. Um, and talk about how I believe it benefits both the player but also the coach. I think that's also a, a misleading argument sometimes about 3 2 1 defence, and a lot of time is spent about the player. Uh, but I think we as coaches, especially of youth handball, have a lot to learn uh, from this style of defence. Um, how I plan to do this, we'll go a bit through the, the principles of open closed defence. I understand there are lots of experienced handball coaches here, but there also might be some guys from uh, another scene. Um, then we'll go through what I believe the challenges uh, to be of, of implementing such a defence. Have a quick look at my playbook uh, if I was to take a snapshot uh, today. Um, and then we'll start to break down the 3-2-1 um, both the individual and the collective rules. Um, no one wants to listen to me for more than a certain period of time, so we'll have a quick break after that so I can get a coffee, and then we'll come back and look at the stages that I would go through if I was implementing the 3 2 one defence to a, a new team or a youth team or even a senior team that hasn't considered 3 2 one uh, before. And then probably that might open up some doors uh, to some questions later on. Uh, you'll see on the right hand side of the screen there um, an empty an empty sort of section with space for video and, and tactics. Uh, tried to leave this open, I don't know what the layout is on your screens but I'm going to be shoving some some resources over on the right hand side of my screen. Um, so they will come sort of intermittently throughout. Just want to check, is the sound okay guys? uh no it's not perfect we can still hear um the noise it's probably well i don't, I don't know what it is but um probably okay, some got it. issues or whatever say it again sorry guys is it better now oh it still makes we can hear you i can understand you but there's a lot of people um raising that subject so it's making a bit of oh, okay back noise I'm sorry yeah i'm sorry but the sound was better before you changed it Yes, before you've you've uh, shared your screen, it was perfect, and then something happened from then. Oh, okay. I don't know, guys. I'm not that technical, I'm afraid. Um, <laughs> but I can understand you perfectly. Uh, just a bit of noise in the background. I'll just crack on. With it. I'm not so difficult to understand. Um, okay. Um, I don't really want to go into this too much. Quick background uh, to me, I've been in the Faroe Islands uh, coaching both the youth and senior national teams. I was lucky enough to be a part of a huge a huge project that's taking place out in the, the North Sea right now, um, where the Faroe Islands are producing some, some incredibly talented teams. Um, 
had a, a period with the Chinese national team uh, and now I find myself in Norway uh, coaching on both club uh, and, and federation level. Um, the one thing that all four of these have in common uh, is open defence. Um, and that's probably what's going to provide a bit of insight into my 3-2-1 uh, that we're going to go through today. Um, just real quick then. Um, in my playbook, as we're going to see shortly, I've got both 6-0 defence and 3-2-1 defence. The reason is I needed something that's going to sit on both ends of the defensive scale. On one hand, I have the 6-0 defence that is, as we all know, a, a passive defence. It's a very reactive defence. Um, it essentially starts from a, a static uh, point and then answers the question that the attack throw at them in a number of different ways. And these ways, they change from time to time. Um, the three to one defense, the way that I play it, uh, it has the complete opposite effect. It does no waiting around for anybody. It almost gives the attack the answer and allows the attack to try and find a solution. Um, so I, I have both a reactive style uh, uh, of defense and a very proactive style of defense that become both a, a necessary and important learning method for, for young players. Um, but it, the, the key difference for me is, is the fluidity of the rules that are associated to the 6-0 uh, or rather a closed defense and an open defense. Um, both, both forms of defense uh, are hugely important, especially in the education of young players. The 6-0 defense forces young players to learn how to react to change, to understand the game, to understand movements uh, and to understand strengths and weaknesses of the attack. Um, whereas the three to one defense, it, it almost condenses all of that tactical stuff into one bite sized rule or set of rules that they are in full control of at any one moment. Um, I have, uh, I don't know if you can see my screen, this is what I had problems with before. Uh, do you see handball court on the right hand side? Yeah, oh, that's interesting. Um, if we take this. A uh, small snapshot of uh, a Russian screen, a simple everyday situation in, in, in handball at all levels. Pivot players placed between the two and three defenders. Left back has the ball. 6 0 defense. What's well, inviting the pressure and it's reacting to the, the, the threat. Um, the rules associating to this one very specific situation in that green box there, they are ever changing. Does the number two defender lift? Does the number three defender lift? Do any of them lift? Is the left back dangerous enough to shoot from distance? Do we want to allow them to come close? Do we want the pivot player to, to have the shot? Do we not want the pivot player to have the shot? And how does the rest of the 6-0 defense interact with that situation on the right-hand side of the court? All of these processes are happening in collaboration between those two defenders at any one time. Um, and we as coaches, we don't get to have any say on that other than prior tactical preparation beforehand. Um, that is in the moment decision making based on their interpretation of the threats and of the rules. Now, if you start to include three players in this or four players in this and five players in this, all of a sudden you have many, many different uh, tactical scenarios and interpretations among the defenders. Whereas if we put it into a three to one situation, now I can't get my screen to move uh, I apologize but we'll go to this in more detail shortly anyway if you put it into a 3-2-1 formation the same attacking scenario you're actually left with very few if not zero tactical scenarios that have to be decided and initiated on the spot in that moment because what a 3-2-1 defense does for a young player it already gives the answer and their job is just to follow the rules that have been set prior to that moment. Um, there is no trying to find out, do I have the left back or do I have the pivot? There is no how to stay here to get the best effect. The rules have been set out ahead of time and the job is simple, to follow their own rules in this moment. Um, so again, on one hand, you have the, 
the 6-0 defence or the, uh, the closed defence that is designed to challenge the tactical understanding of young players. Very rich learning, very important learning. But on the other hand, you have a defence where they become a lot more accountable to, to follow the rules that are already in place. Um, so that one situation creates two completely different outcomes depending on the formation that we're playing. The challenges, of course, the 6-0 defense, young players, they, they are incomplete. They are not ready. They are not masters of learning uh, right now. And majority of them are not able to make ultimate decisions in ultimate moments of the game. And what a 6-0 defense does is it allows the attack to throw questions at the defense. Uh, and if the defense is not able to answer those questions, we have a big problem. The challenges for the 3-2-1 is that although it puts it down into its simplest form, um, it ultimately challenges uh, the individual efficiency of an, of an individual player. Um, and when that efficiency is not met and one of the players lose a battle, well, then we risk uh, conceding the goal, whatever the case, because in order for a 3-2-1 defense to work, um, you need every player to be following their uh, agreements to the letter. Well, you can um, jump in with a quick question. Go on, mate. You just, you're, you're using the word efficiency uh, quite often, and one of the questions that's come into the group is, what does it mean? Can you just um, elaborate on, on what it could be? Yeah, I think um, efficiency to me, Bob, uh, and to anyone asking, is, uh, is heavily rel um, linked to the 3-2-1 defence. I talk about efficiency with 3-2-1 defence because the rules are in place. The barriers are in place and the question is how well are you able to carry out that fully controllable mandate, fully controllable rules. Um, when I talk about 6-0 defence, I, I talk about being effective because it's a collaboration. Efficiency, I'm talking about physical and technical uh, efficiency regarding 3-2-1 defence. If you are efficient, you are efficient probably at getting the job done. Uh, that is in your rule book. Um, I don't necessarily talk about efficiency about six zero t uh, defense. Uh, an efficient six zero defense is the is the whole thing. It's whether we concede or do not concede a goal in that attack. Um, so that's why I use the word efficient in three two one um, because we're not looking for something pretty. We're looking for something efficient. Uh, we're looking for something that works uh, and does the job that it says in the manual. Uh, and that's the ultimate difference between three, two, one defense, uh, as I see. Um, I don't really want to go into this too much again about the uh, about taking this small tactical scenario. We know the challenge of a three, two, one defense, where players are exposed to more space, uh, and this creates a bigger challenge in isolation. Um, we know the challenge is about six zero defense. If one person doesn't have the same interpretation uh, of the rule. Uh, as the player standing next to them, where well, they're going to have big problems. Um, but there are challenges on both sides of the coin here. My playbook, if we were to take a snapshot right now, it includes three different styles of defense. A 3 2 1 defense is my go to disruptive pressure defense. In my opinion, every coach needs to have a disruptive defense in their playbook, uh, whether they have a <laughs> Uh, if they have big players who aren't necessarily suitable for 3-2-1 defense, to me it doesn't matter. The idea of learning a defense where they are highly accountable for their roles and the completion of their jobs, this is a very important process for all young players to learn. 3-2-1 um, is mine. I also have um, a... Traditional 6-0 defense. I don't know if you can see the screen here. Uh, just one simple clip from a match we played against the Vipers in the Norwegian Elite Series this season. Um, the start has a starting formation as a 6-0, but my, especially my back players in defense, they give them freedom to roam and freedom to, sit, uh, to create traps. Um, so you will see here the left back um, in, a, in a second. Firstly, she puts a bit of pressure on the right back, but take a look at her movement now. Now she's going to come in and set the, set the trap. Um, so we have traditional 6-0 defense um, 
with a traditional starting point, but my backs are allowed freedom. And I'm also playing a more Spanish style of 6-0 defense that starts as a traditional 6-0, but throughout the attack uh, tends to open into something that looks like a 3-2-1. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail about these things now. You can have a whole seminar on, on these other two types of defense. Um, but if you see here the video, a couple of examples of my recruit team, and these girls are 16... 16 years old, 17 years old, starting in a 6-0. And then when the, the play happens, um, they're lifting into something that looks incredibly like a, a 3-2-1 defense following 3-2-1 defense rules. Um, so these are the three things you will find in my, in my playbook. Um, and I believe there's three things here that create different challenges for young players to have to deal with. I don't know if there's any questions on this so far, boys. Just let me know if there is. A few, few people were asking about rules of the 3-2-1, but you, I know you're going to move on to that shortly. Yeah, we'll come into it now. Okay, my 3-2-1. Uh, if you were to be a flyer on the wall in, in my training, and I'm conscious of the fact that Bill Bailey's here, um, <laughs> obviously my, my learning of 3-2-1 comes from, from Bill, for example, uh, with the, the Great Britain teams. Um, a huge uh, impact on the way that I built uh, my defence. But it has one ultimate objective, and that's to force the attack into to very uncomfortable positions. We're working a lot with the percentages in my 3-2-1 defence. We're allowing shooting situations um, from very specific areas, and this is normally between the wing and the back defence. Typically, anything shot-wise that comes between the wing and the back, we're allowing so long as the angle to the goal is not a strong one. Um, we are keeping the ball away from the middle zone uh, and we are doing everything we can to squeeze the ball into the outer areas. It's very rigid. Normally, I don't know if a lot of you have tried this before, but normally when we put, or when I put young players into open defensive positions, they see it as an excuse to go fishing for the ball. Um, and what this can lead to is a hell of a lot of chaos. Uh, in the moment. This is not how I'm defending a 3-2-1 defense and it's not how I'm teaching the 3-2-1 defense. There is more discipline in the 3-2-1 than there is in any type of defense in my mind. Um, so when I'm teaching this, there are yes, no rules. Things you can do and things you cannot do and it is not open to interpretation. It's very ball orientated. You will see from that little animation at the top there, there is always two players between the ball and the goal. Um, and it's a pressure defense in that if we were to play 3 2 1, a good match for us would include a lot of turnovers, a lot of stoppages in the play, and a lot of shots uh, from the areas that we choose. So the premise, the premise for the attack is not theirs. They do not own the attack when we are playing 3-2-1 defense because we are going to give them precisely what we want to give them. And this is the opposite philosophy to a 6-0 defense where the attack give us the problem and it's our job to solve it. Uh, and that's the difference between a reactive and a proactive defense and it's exactly why I love playing 3-2-1 defense with young players. We're forcing the pressure and the stress now on the attacking team. Uh, I put the last point here, led by the Chief of Security. Uh, this is just the nickname of the player who I have in the middle of my defence. And ultimately, they are me on the court in that moment. They are the point where my wing defenders and my back defenders are all working from. And they have ultimate control over what is happening all around them. Um, without this player in my team, my 3-2-1 defense will not succeed. So if anyone is completely inspired when they go away from this and they think next week I'm going to have a 3-2-1 defense, you better be taking a look at which player is the most accountable, the most reliable, the best leader, the best communicator. And we're talking about holistic skills here. The, the chief of security in my 3-2-1 defense isn't necessarily the best player on the team but it is the player that everyone will say yes to, okay, boss to, when uh, demands are made from them. Um, so they're really the focal point of which all of the other move movements uh, stem from. 
Um, so real quick, I'm going to go into the individual in, in uh, the individual rules, um, and we'll probably come back to the collective rule shortly uh, to see whether they marry up. But like I said before, guys, when I'm creating a free two on defense from start to finish, I'm building it based on individual rules for each position in defense. They do not necessarily need to know what the rules are to another player. The fact is, if they can get their rules uh, in place and abide by their, their rules, then the defense should work efficiently. When they get to a certain point where they've mastered their own individual rules, then the focus becomes the collective understanding. Where do we want a shot from? What happens if we lose? What happens if that happens? Um, but in the teaching of my 3 two, one we are very heavily focused on the individual rules of each specific position, certainly at the start point. So my chief of security, uh, they can be found between the ball and the goal. They are chief backup to my right back, to my point defender, my left back. Uh, if any one of those three defenders lose, my chief of security is there to, to make sure they uh, make the kill. Um, they are operating on six meters. I very rarely want my middle defender to be lifting. Uh, only in extreme situations will this be required in my defense. Um, and like I said, they are the backup. They are the three fundamental rules. Um, and they can be characterized by a dictatorship. They are in complete control. They have full authority uh, and they have communication with, with everyone else on the team. Imagine that they have the rest of their players on string when, uh, when the ball is moving from left to right uh, and they are pulling that string and pushing that string uh, when necessary. Um, the number two defenders, these little two blue pins, they are the first uh, positions that are working out of the chief of security, i.e. where they are is determined on where the chief of security is, when they do not have the ball. So they are either in an open position on nine meters in relation to the ball, or they're in a closed position and they are working in connection with the center defender. They have to be either on A or B position. They are never in between. Um, movement with movement, Bill Bailey uh, statement. When the ball is moving, their legs are moving. Um, that means that when the ball is being played over from the playmaker to the back, their legs are moving and they are in position on nine meters, uh, ready for the one against one battle that's about to come. Um, and it's really a pincer movement. When one's in, the other one is out. When one's in, the other one is out. Um, so they are working in heavy connection, these three players in, in, the, in the defense. Oh, sorry. Nine meters is enough. I've seen three, two, one defenses that look like three, three defenses that look like man to man defenses. Um, nine meters for me is enough because if the left back or right back score from 10 or 11 or 12 meters, we give them a clap and we say, well done, good job. Um, nine meters is enough for me. Uh, the wings. Um, they are staying on six meters. I don't need them to lift apart from when the ball is on the opposite side of the court. Maybe they look then to squeeze the angle between one and two, uh, but really their job is to, to stay on six meters and to never lose inside when the wingers get the ball. They have a very individual role in this three, two, one defense, uh, and to lose between one and two is the primary uh, primary rule for wing players not to do. Um, as you know, to be a wing player in the defense isn't always enjoyable, but this 3-2-1 defense, if we have weak wingers who can't take care of their direct opponent, my 3-2-1 defense is simply not going to work. Uh, this is why I don't need them to go out and be fishing for a ball. I'd much rather have that they take care of their one specific job and allow the rest of my defense to take it further. Um, and the final position in, in my 3 two, one defense, if we take the individual, individual rules, are the front number three. Now, this, this position, depending on whether you're in one of the Balkan nations or whether you're over in Spain or over in Brazil, um, 
I find that these positions operate differently. Um, and it's all about where do we want to send the playmaker? Where do you want to send the ball? My 3-2-1 defense, uh, they're holding very specifically in the middle zone. Uh, they're not worrying too much about what's happening uh, around them other than they want to try to keep the ball in front of them. Um, they are not waving their arms around like a lunatic uh, going up to 50 meters and then dropping down to, to 60 meters and stuff like this. They're holding a very stable position. Um, and their main job is to split the court into two. So if you imagine from the goal line up to the penalty spot, up until where the playmaker is, we have the left side of the court and the right side of the court. When the ball is on the left side, we want the, the, the court to be split in two and allow the attack to play just on the left side. When the ball is on the right side, they're going to split the court again and we're going to invite the attack to play just on the right side. If they attack want to move the ball from one side to another, they're going to do it by going always through the playmaker. Never a back-to-back -back pass. So if you look at the positioning of my point defender, when any one of the backs have the ball, they're in between. We are not accepting a back-to-back -back pass. Um, I think I have this example here, if you can see. If you check out the positioning now, always between the two backs, an offering pass to the playmaker, and if the ball goes from back to back, we're happy to take this. Um, so we have, in the last three or four minutes, assembled two or three or four individual rules uh, for my individual defenders that, if worked uh, efficiently, will contribute now to the collective understanding. Whether they are uh, thinking about the collective objectives in the moment in the game, we don't know. This will eventually become an unconscious thought. But the objective should be, before we start concentrating on what the final outcomes are for the team, can we get them to a point where they have mastered their individual rules and the movement pattern? And I believe that if we can do that, we have cracked 90% of this equation. And it's unique that you can crack an equation before you even get to the match situation with a defense. Because the 6-0 defense requires opponent. It requires the attack to throw 10 million different scenarios at you and eventually you will master how to deal with each one of them. The 3-2-1 defense, we have the full control over our ability to be efficient. And then it's up to the attack to beat us with physical ability, to beat us with a system that we've not seen, or to change something in some way that go outside our rules of engagement. Um, so we have something that looks like the collective understanding. Um, I'm happy to throw out to the public here if there's anything that you have seen so far that you have any pressing matters. There's one question around the rules. Uh, I think yep. everything else Bob can throw at you at the end or later. I'm not sure that he will do whenever he sees fit. But in terms of the rules of the centre-back, uh, yep. someone asked uh, what would be the, the exceptional conditions where you would allow your centre-back to lift off the six metres? Um, good question. Uh, when, for example, my... It's hard to demonstrate here without this tactics board sorry guys i had the tactics board here i was going to pull up some scenarios but i haven't got it uh, a good example is when my number two defender loses my one of my left or right back loses uh, and the pivot player for the attacking team is lying completely away from the ball so let's throw a scenario here um where the left back attacker beats my right back defender but the pivot player is nowhere to be seen because they're on the other side of the court, then I will allow my number three to come up. But if the pivot player is on the same, same side of the court, my pivot player, my middle back is staying with the pivot, and instead my point defender is going to go over there and make a recovery. Um, there are not, Ricardo, many exceptional circumstances where my middle defender is lifting because they are the only consistent factor in the middle zone on six meters. 
Um, instead of my centre back helping too much my left and right back defenders, instead it's going to be my point defender who's making a lot of that effort because my particular three to one defence has a recovery initiative um, that doesn't require my middle back to lift. And we'll go through this in, in a bit. I hope I've answered. Yeah, thank you. I'm not sure if Bob has anything else he wants to raise now. Yeah, I don't know if it's an opportune moment to, to come in with these, but there's a few questions around um, how are you going to deal with uh, a wing coming in as a second pivot, Scott? I mean, the, some of the rules you're, you're talking about at the moment are very probably more towards how the the, four, the standard attacking formation is set up. So how might the yeah. team have to learn to adapt to, to those situations? Yeah, I've actually just put a, a clip up on the screen there uh, with uh, wing transition and back transition. Uh, wing transition you'll see happening now from the left wing um, and my middle back there right now is with the pivot and now all that's going to happen is a simple change it's counting numbers very basic counting numbers my right back is going to stay up because so long as there's a left back in position she's in position my right wing defender now has to find the next available player which is always going to be a pivot player in this scenario and my middle back is going to take ownership of the player who's coming in and give her over to the next player. So she's the lynch here and there's always opportunity for uh, counting of the numbers and assigning the duty in that moment. With the back transition, um, actually we end up playing this incorrectly but we get it right in the end. My left number two defender is going to give the right back to my middle defender who's going to take ownership and then make the necessary uh, changes. We'll come into the agreements for transition, wing transition, back transition, playmaker transition shortly. But ultimately, whilst we're on it, if there comes a wing transition, my wingers are going to squeeze in and my number two defenders are going to go even higher. And we're going to force, if you look here, we're going to force the left back to go out of the court now. This for us is a good situation where we're happy to have a shooting, uh, a shot conceded because this is not a high chance uh, shooting from the left back. Um, when there comes back transition, my, the back where they're running the transition from will typically go in and we will defend a 4-2. And if they run a playmaker transition, then my back will go in again because I want my point defender to stay up. Um, when we have a small break in a minute, I'll try to get this tactics board working and, uh, and be able to show you, practically speaking, what that looks like. Um, but right now, Bob, to answer your question, this is just the fundamentals. This is the skeleton of the 3-2-1 defense. What I call change management, what happens when changes come with the attack, this comes later in the series. Because what I want for them to do is master basic 3 two, one before they start to get confused and frustrated with what happens when and the what-if scenarios. Okay, thanks mate. Um, okay, where are we at time-wise, boys? I think we'll have a quick two-minute break. I need a coffee. Okay, fine, yeah. If you want to do that now, you can. No problem whatsoever. Um, All right, sweet. Guys, if uh, obviously... Uh, Scott is going to try to, to get his tactical pad on uh, whilst on the break, so we're going to give him two minutes to do that. Uh, I suggest, well, this is going to stay here. I suggest we pause for a second and, and uh, you come back in two minutes' time. Maybe think some questions you might want to might want to throw at him and, and send them to the chat, something like that. So we're going to be back and well, we're going to stay live. So Scott will resume in no time. Yeah, just some um, bits for me. We've got some questions uh, that have come into the group already around uh, what would we introduce first? Would it be 6-0? Would it be 3-2-1? What would we introduce with the younger players? We'll ask Scott's opinion on this uh, when he's back in the room. Uh, some other things kind of that we've already been talking about is the adaptability piece. So how uh, are the, is the defensive system adapting to, to change uh, from the attacking team? Uh, there's been a question around goalkeepers and goalkeeping efficiency. What's the expectations of the goalkeeper? Uh, so we'll definitely follow up uh, with, on, with Scott on those questions. But if there's anything else, please feel free to throw it into the chat now. That's a good question, that one about which comes first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> I 
I can hear that buzzing as well now. Why can I hear it? Uh, we can only hear it when you when you speak, mate. It's not the buzzing. It's it's uh, background noise when you when you speak. It sounds like every Apologies, time you speak, God. there's wind uh, blowing into your mic at the same time. If that makes sense. Unbelievable. Okay. So to Antonio, that's asking about uh, sharing the PowerPoint. Obviously, this, the, the session, the webinar is being recorded. So all the recordings are going to be shared with you uh, and everyone else. So they are on the England Handball web page. And they are also on the registration link. So you're going to be able to access uh, this session, past sessions, and all the future sessions that we are, we are going to promote and record. So everything should be made available to all of you online that way. No problem. I'm having real problems with this tactics board. Unbelievable. Sorry, oh. is there a possibility to get the text of the chat session as well? The text of the chat? Yeah. I know that voice. Sorry, who said that? I know that voice. That's, that's I. I. I told him. It's Mark, Mark Multa from Belgium. And... Oh. Um, I'm wondering if it would be possible to to get the the chat session, the text of it as well. I don't know, probably well, don't know if that's possible. There are some interesting questions as well. Well, we, we can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself, mate. Please. Sorry, I'll have to check out the 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 um uh, the recording and the what 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 saved on Zoom. I'm not sure if we at have. the at the at the bottom of the uh, the group chat. There's a file button. I think if yep. you press that, you can save it as a file. Yeah, that's right. Too, you, Billy. Thanks, mate. You can email that out. Yeah, we'll do. All right, guys. I think I've got it working. Thank you. So, um, so I tried to crack on. Are we good to go? Yeah, yeah. Whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, so, like I said before, uh, my three-two-one defense is built heavily on rules. It's it's not open to interpretation. They do not get to decide, ah, maybe I don't follow this rule this time. In order for my 3 2 on defense to be efficient, everything must be working uh, to the rules, both individually and towards the collective understanding. Um, and the collective understanding here, just uh, very quickly, if I show you this, We are happy for the ball to be in the green zones here. We are not happy for the ball to be in the red zone. The wing, well, there's a bit of uh, discussion about this. What's a good chance for the wing attacker? What's a good chance for us? But ultimately, my whole defense is built around stopping every ball coming into the red zone. And we are happy for the ball to be executed from anywhere in that, that green zone. Uh, a good match for us would be 20 shots conceded between one and two as the right back or left back is moving away from the court. Um, again, we don't want a situation where the right back is coming through here. This all of a sudden becomes a very inefficient uh, situation for us. Um, but between one and two is where we're going for here. Um, in terms of the stages of implementation, I'm going to try to show you something that looks like this. Uh, I have five stages of implementation. And to me, it's simple. To other people, it might not be simple. Um, and of course, there are lots of moving parts to the way you implement a whole new type of defense. Um, but it's best to start at stage one and end at stage five. As soon as you start springing in over specific elements of this, uh, we start to have holes in the in the development. I'm going to go through each individual stage. Um, the first stage, uh, this is developing the movement patterns. Um, the point before we even go into the defense, where do I be, where do I need to be when the ball is in this position, and where do I need to be when the ball is in that position? We're now creating the bare bones of this defense. 
this is a very behavioral task. It's a bit like teaching your dog how to sit or roll over. Um, it doesn't take long. And once it's in, it's in. Um, so we're really developing the muscle memory of the movements here. I think the video is here from an under 11 team uh, that I started a 3 2 on defense with. And all I'm doing in this video is pointing from side to side, and that represents where the ball is. Uh, and they have to all move in their individual ways uh, every time I make the signal. The only thing I'm looking at here is the intensity, the feet and body orientation in relation to where the ball is, and the connection with the closest teammate. Um, this is the most fundamental task at the start of preparing this 3 2 one defense, as far as I'm concerned. Because unless they have the movement patterns under, under control, uh, it's pointless going into the next part. Everything works in collaboration with the next player. Um, so I'll always start with the movement patterns first. And once they've mastered this, we can move on as quickly as we can. Uh, the second stage for me is introducing uh, a ball and an attack. Uh, but we're doing this still very much in a uh, instructive manner. It's very staged and it's in a very controlled um, sort of atmosphere uh, that we're working with this. Transition into game relevance yet controlled situations with lots of trial and error, repetition, feedback, questioning, um, but still very much a drill-based uh, process where they're now starting to learn their individual rules but they're doing it in relation to both the ball uh, and an attacker. Um, focus here on building the next layer to the, the movement patterns and putting some game relevant context uh, to it. Um, my job as a coach in this moment is to, is still very much as an instructive one um, because we're still talking about rules that are not interpretive they are the rules and the rules have to be followed to the letter um but there will be a, a process of of, of challenging uh, their behavior throughout uh, to make sure that what's going in is staying in um this can be done in different ways like i said still very much drill related but it shouldn't shouldn't be taking up the full trading session that i have it can be incorporated into other general aspects of uh, of the training um, but we're now starting to, to drip feed in these three, two, one individual rules into, into their minds. The third stage for me, uh, and this is the most important one as far as I'm concerned. Um, now we're starting to teach for understanding rather than behavior. Um, with this is essentially implicit learning we're, we're providing the the barriers uh, and we're allowing them in three against three and four against four situations um under certain constraints um to develop their understanding of their individual rules in relation to their teammates around them so a lot of three against three takes place four against four just playing on the left side of the court, just playing in the middle uh, zone of the court, just playing on the opposite side of the court. Uh, and this is where we're starting to, as a, from a coaching perspective, shifting from the dictator to the conservative in this sense. Making sure that all the way we are enforcing the rules, enforcing the collective understanding, and then we're allowing them to work to those constraints. Um, so our coaching becomes a bit more constructive and we start to hand over now a bit of responsibility to key components of that 3-2-1 defense in that moment. Um, like I said, by this point, movement patterns um, are starting to be mastered. Focus shifts into combining now the movement patterns with the, the collective objectives. Um, I had... A clip I'll go back to this stage four and by the way how long these stages take uh, is completely dependent on the groups that we're working with um, stage the stage three developing understanding uh, and, a, and a real uh, implicit understanding of what's going on here to be able to react to change in the moment this takes time and you cannot trick your way to uh, to tactical understanding in anything you do in handball um, 
So this will take as long as it takes. Uh, but it's certainly probably the most challenging one because it's going from me telling what my players what to do into one where they're having to find answers. Uh, and there's a big difference in this, especially if they don't have the answer somewhere at the back of their head ahead of time. Um, stage four, we're really starting now to put the, what do you call it in English, skin on the bone. Um, we're in, we're in, enhancing the match relative experience. Uh, we're building the layer, five against five, six against six. Um, and we're really talking about a constructive um, sort of training setup here where pretty much uh, full autonomy now is handed to the chief of security and the key components of the three two one defense in any specific moment. Um, it's still training, but it's uncontrolled. Uh, increased responsibility and ownership is transferred, like I said. Um, the step sequence is by this point, the individual rules are now unconscious competences. Bill Bailey again. Um, the, this is in there now. Now we don't need to be talking too much about this because we've spent enough time in their development phases of this 3 2 on defense that they're there. Uh, which means we can now focus fully on the new objective. And the new objective is to try to bring together our individual uh, requirements into a team-based situation. Um, like I said, a bit of revision is probably necessary in terms of our coaching methods for this type of training. When we're talking about small-sided games, we're really talking about efficient use of our words, coaches, um, we go a lot away from instruction and giving into allowing players to find answers based out of the scenarios that they're provided with. Um, but ultimately what we're doing, we're still isolating the collective objectives here in a smaller base situation. Um, the last stage for me is a, is a trick stage, really. This is where we start to... Um, look at the, the changes that can come during the attack. Step one, step two, step three, step four. This is fully under our control when we're training the development of my 3-2-1 defense. Um, stage five, this is ultimately uh, the parts that we're going to come unstuck on in a match. And this includes things like when the attacking team go uh, run transition uh, and when any changes come that we've not prepared for in our skeleton build up to to the three two one play um i don't know if you're reading the screen or listening to me but ultimately what we're going to do now is we're going to go back to stage three we're going to go back to stage three because now we want to recover some of the small-sided games but very specifically now uh covering changes so that three against three or four against four exercise i did a couple of weeks ago when we're learning the fundamentals of 3-2-1, now becomes the same exercise, but now we're running a transition from the right back or the playmaker. or we've, we've got two pivots in there from the start point. Um, so now we're, we're almost, we're reenacting the changes that might come, but we're still doing it in a very controlled manner. Uh, and what I find this to, to do is it almost helps cement uh, the understanding um, and the repetition allows them to essentially have a period of trial and error before they eventually come to a game and when it comes to a game and the team runs a wing transition or back transition or something like this it's not unnormal to have to deal with um, after this we're talking about strategy um, these are the points here where things like video analysis um, and tactical analysis they become an everyday part of my training um, before training, after training, during training. The first three stages of this whole, the whole process, they're behavioral tasks. They don't need much explanation or interpretation. Just do the tasks, but do it in an efficient way. Um, when you start getting to stage three, four, and five, you, start, you have to start analyzing what's going on in this moment. Um, and no matter how old your, your players are, um, it's a really rich process to be going through with young players 
because all of a sudden they start to have to have a mouth and be responsible for what comes out of it. Um, and this is where you find out uh, who is really involved in what you're doing and who is not involved in what you're doing. Um, so for me, it's a six, five, six stage process. Uh, you can, of course, choose to skip over any of these ones, but I wouldn't recommend it. I certainly don't. And what I do, I typically set up a, a six week block um, of time where I'm working through these sequences. So for example, say uh, you want to start a 3-2-1 defense now in May, assuming we get back on the handball court in good time. Um, the stages that I might go through to implement this with a youth team is I'll start with stage one in week one, then I'll move on to stage two. Stage three might take two weeks, might take a bit longer, might be a bit shorter. Stage four, after this and then as we head into uh, the later part of june before we all go on holiday um we're then going through the smaller variable details uh before we break away when we come back after the summer we're then going to have a fire a fire sale of um of all of these stages spending a bit of extra time on the final stage which puts us in some level of match preparedness uh that we're going for here the difference between this three, two, one, and these stages of implementation and a six, zero defense to the best of my understanding is that the six, zero defense is so fluid that you can stand for many hours and talk to your players about how to defend specific situations in a six, zero defense and then come to a match and all of a sudden, two plus two no longer equals four in the game in that moment. Because there has been a change to the conditions. There's been a change to the situation. The left back is no longer the same left back. The pivot player is no longer the same position. Somebody's having a very good game and all of a sudden, we don't want that situation to occur anymore. Everything is so fluid. Whereas with a 3 two, one defense, you can almost break the components down into specific bite-sized pieces and build it in a kind of hierarchy of importance uh, as we move up. Yes, there are, of course, moving parts to a 3 two, one defense that require more than just a, a calendar, a, a calendar uh, for us to work through. But my experience of 3 two, one defense, given the tactical considerations that are involved, it is easier, I don't want to say easy, but easier to create a start point up until an execution date than it is a 6-0 defense. Because a 6-0 defense, I don't believe anyone ever masters because it's full of uncontrollable, variable situations. Um, and to go to the question that I think you had before, Bob, about which comes first, 6-0 or 3-2-1. Uh, I'm playing both. Uh, it depends what type of coach you are. If you want to win as many games as possible at a young age, I am nine times out of ten playing 3-2-1 defense because I believe it's easier to install in the psyche of a young player than a 6-0 defense. That's my philosophy. Um... I believe that the 6-0 defense is absolutely necessary learning. First and foremost, because when you get to senior level, most teams are playing 3-2-1 uh, defense. So you have to have an in-depth understanding of it and how to maneuver around it. But at the young ages, both a closed defense and an open defense, they come with so many important developmental points that you absolutely have to be at some level playing both, both in training and in match situations. 6-0 for the tactical element, as far as I'm concerned, and 3-2-1 for the disciplinarian element uh, for any young player. Um, and for me, that's what it's about. Uh, I want to go back to the start point here. That's what it's about when we're talking about 6-0 defense and 3-2-1 defense. On one hand, you've got something that's highly fluid. The problem for coaches 
the problem for coaches, as far as I'm aware, especially young coaches, I've had this experience before. I remember Bill was my assistant coach when I first took the England uh, under-18 team. The problem I had was that we're full of ideas. We're full of small initiatives and stuff that we can use to go and beat the best nations in the world. The problem is it's not practical. It's difficult to use and it's difficult to analyze. So in a timeout, in a one minute timeout, and you're defending a 6-0 defense where you have so many moving parts, it is difficult to very clearly get to the source of a problem. Because the problem might be sixfold. The problem might exist in many areas of the court, but it's hard to see. And what do we do? We blame it on the fact that our blocking in that moment wasn't good enough. That's the most common thing. Ah, we, we need to be better at blocking. No, the excuse must never be blocking. You know, our ability to block a shot. For me, there's something deeper to the problem. Whereas in a 3-2-1 defense, for me as a coach, especially in the starting points, I would have said that I could see with some certainty in a game, if we concede a goal from the wrong situation, which player might be responsible for the start of that problem. Because it's easier to see who has not followed a very clear, precise rule rather than to see somebody's interpretation of a mistake. And that, for me, is why as a coach, 3-2-1 defence absolutely has to be a part of the, the playbook, not just because it's great education for young players to learn how to defend in isolated zones and blah, 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 but it's also brilliant for a coach because there are, some, there are times in matches and in training where absolute clarity is needed. And clarity only comes from uh, X's and O's situations. 6-0 defense, for as much tactical understanding as it develops, important understanding, it's also very difficult to determine the X and O situation, the clear, precise explanation of a positive or a negative um, and, and that for me represents a challenge to, to coaches um, so I don't know if I can answer your question Bob about what comes first 3 two, one defense or 6 zero defense all I can say is in my time as being a coach and we're getting on to 10-12 years now um, I've always had both I've always had both because there are, there are matches and there are training situations that require a closed defense. And there are games and there are training that require individual accountability and discipline. Um, the mixture of implicit and explicit training and matches where players are following rules, this is important. The blend of that is very important as far as I'm concerned. Um, and that's why I can't say, but... If you want to win at the early ages, you're probably onto a good opportunity if you can very clearly uh, deliver a 3-2-1 defense to your junior team. Because I think to the attack, it places the emphasis on them to find a solution to your problem rather than them to develop the problem and you to have the answers. I'd much rather play my handball on the front foot, uh, which is why in any one of my defenses that I play, um, where are we here? My playbook. In any one of these three defences that I play, I believe I'm taking the initiative with each of these three. And no point am I standing down and allowing the attack to throw problems at us for us to solve. At the first sign of any problems, I'm reacting uh, and creating an initiative to win back initiative uh, against the attacking team. Uh, I can talk about this all day long. Uh, I don't have too much more, uh, guys, in terms of my uh, presentation other than... Scott, other there's, than a few, there's a few questions. We don't have uh, a lot of time as well um, yeah. to go through. Um, I think before I give the floor uh, to Bob to use, obviously, the, um, the questions on the chat, I would just like to bring you back to the coach behavior side of things that you mentioned uh, in your yeah. individual tactical stage one and you were showing us or you were showing us how you go through the basic movement patterns of your on your, on your system on your model yeah uh, I guess the question would be 
uh, when you do that, do you dictate the rules prior to uh, engaging in the discovery of the model? Or do you set up tasks that will allow them to make that discovery initially uh, on themselves or at least to inform that? Discovery? Yeah, I, I, I f f <laughs> it depends which road I want to go down here, guys. If I go down the coach education route, um, I'm, I'm doing it one way. And if I'm going down, in my opinion, efficiency route, I'm going down another way. You can be sure on one thing. My young players, it doesn't matter how old they are, they know what the outcome is before we've started these drills. I am not trying to entice them into a situation where they think, oh, maybe it's good to be here, or maybe it's good to be there. When No, for me, that's not important. That part comes later on. Whether they are at position A or B is not a decision they get to make and is, for me, inconsequential. I need them to have the right level of mental and physical intensity that's the only thing that's related to this uh, this issue um i will try to do it in the most i don't know pedagogical way possible but i don't believe it's a pedagogical task we do not teach kids in school to sit down and stand up and roll over we teach them how to be creative uh this is not a creative task this is a task that once they've mastered it we can move on to the next one um, where I will start to be a bit more expressive uh, is the next stage, stage number two, where once they have the movement uh, patterns in place, how now do I want to posture myself? How now do I want to have my feet? How now would I do this? And then it becomes a question of what's the most uh, effective. Um, and maybe the answer comes from them rather from me. But certainly no, in regarding to the movement patterns, this is not an interpretation. This is a, you're doing it this way, because if you don't do it this way, somebody else is going to suffer as a result. Yeah, I think it's not, it's the, the question wasn't necessarily how they do it. Uh, it was more about how they discover the right way, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'm, uh, listen, I'm a big fan of using, of using a, a tactics board uh, and, and video also with kids. It doesn't matter how old they are. I think kids are more intelligent than we often give them credit for. Um, so long as they have a, a prior context in place. I don't know if I would, for example, go into a, a primary school in the UK and show them what I would show a Norwegian nine or 10 years old kid. Um, so then you can start to question the approaches I would take to instill this, this type of defense. Um, but uh, certainly, certainly no, it, it's, it's something that they know beforehand. And before we move on to the next stages here, I am demanding that they have mastered these uh, sequences. Okay, perfect. Bobby, I don't know if you want to yeah. carry on. Yeah, so um, just if we can carry on for another 10 minutes or so with some, some more questions from the group. So there was a, a question, and, and Scotty, you can fully appreciate this, that you, you're presenting to people from all over the world at the moment, um, not least to your uh, former colleagues back here in the UK, and that we've got some particular challenges that we have compared to the situation you're in in Norway with how many sessions per week you have with your club. Um, mm -hmm. Therefore, maybe you can take a different approach to your delivery. What advice would you give to uh, coaches in the UK or other parts of the world that have one session per week with, let's say, with they're starting with an under-14 team, you know, you, you, you've made reference to how you do it in, with your club in Norway, but how would you do it back here if you were starting up with a club here? Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I know those challenges very well. Um, listen, whatever, whatever I'm going to say here is going to be a challenge. Um, I'm fortunate to have uh, exclusive access to a sports hall and to have access to the right space and the right equipment and players who fortunately know what handball is prior to us going into this. So, so it provides context uh, to what we're doing. If I was to come to England now and try the same process, there is no doubt I would need to adapt it. Um, the, adapt, the adaptation phase um, would first and foremost be the length of time required to be able to pull this off. If you are training one time in a week, you're going to have a big problem because to go from stage to stage requires mastering of the concept, either the movement patterns or the individual rules. Um, 
kids in England would get a hell of a lot more homework. I can tell you that much. Uh, you know, when we sacrifice time on a handball court, um, their own work away from the handball court becomes a lot more important for us um, because maybe we're a bit strapped for time. Um, but I don't see any barriers to introducing a solid 3 2 1 formation in the UK with limited space and limited time. I don't see the barriers. I see the barriers uh, as creativity barriers for us as coaches. Um, and when I look back to the UK now, for example, um, I see a lot of very efficient 3 2 1 situations. I see Ricardo coaching the British men's team in a very efficient 3 2 1. Um, the question is, are we doing it in the right way and the most meaningful way for that particular group? I think also when I coached back in the UK, we played a, a 3 2 1 defense as well. Um, and we're talking about players who trained once a week for their club and trained nearly never for the national team. Um, so there are, there are particular constraints. I think the amount of online work that you do, the amount of video work that you do, the amount of homework that happens is going to be more. Um, but the expectation is going to be the same. Okay, thanks, mate. Um, another question that was mentioned earlier on, and it's a question very close to my heart, um, goalkeeping. Where does goalkeeping fit in in the 3 to one defensive system? Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, one that comes after the three two one defense. Uh, the first thing I'd say about it is, when you're defending three two one defense, the likelihood is is that you're going to get shots from different areas than you would be used to when you're defending a six zero defense. For example, you have to look at it like this: every defense gives something and takes something away. A six zero defense gives an attack space from distance. Uh, it gives them limited space from the wings and limited space to break through because you've got six bodies all around six feet to line. So it gives something and it takes something away. A 3 2 one defense gives something entirely different. Uh, what it gives is opportunity to play into space. So what it takes away is the ability to shoot from distance. Um, so what you expect of a 3 two, one defense, if you're a goalkeeper, you're expecting that there's going to come more shots uh, from six meters and more shots from the wide points. So of course your training needs to be adapted to take care of these uh, needs. If I have a goalkeeper who's amazing from taking shots from distance, but cannot do anything up close, you have to wonder whether three to one is a, is a, a realistic solution uh, for, for a defense. Um, but the training that we're doing when we're training 3 to one defense in the movement patterns or in the small-sided games, there is also a lot of activity here for the goalkeepers. Uh, the goalkeepers will have more opportunity than they will have ever had before to face shots between the one and two, to face shots from the wing, um, because that's what's going to come if we do our jobs uh, accordingly. A lot less time is spent uh, in collaboration with a block and the goalkeeper who takes the far post who takes the near post because with that's not what we're going for in a 3-2-1 defense we're not going for shots from distance and it would be crazy if our opponents came with that idea what we're going for is to put them into a very specific situation and our hope is that by the time they come to a match that they've seen that particular situation 10,000 times before uh, before the shot comes in the moment so it's a very aggressive defense uh, but we have to understand that the ball is being now played further away from the defence. Um, so that also has an effect on the goalkeeper as well. Okay, mate, thanks for that. And I'm going to finish up with one more question, unless Ricardo has any more. Um, and it was more around the, the softer sort of skills that you'd bring from a coaching perspective. So you mentioned before about, you know, you was working with like an under-12s group and it would be, a, the, the term in your slide was it, training could be unenjoyable and, you know, you're... you're being very explicit with your instructions. Are there uh, other softer coaching skills that you would use to help support their, you know, their enjoyment of the session, I suppose? Yeah, listen, uh, it depends what you define as, as uh, unenjoyable. Um, if you have an innate motivation to come to training and work hard, uh, you are, the chances are you're going to enjoy three to one defense a lot. Uh, if you are a player who moves when they absolutely need to move uh, and you do the same also when you're at home on your sofa and when you're in school 
uh, the chances are you're not going to enjoy training teams around an open defense because they require different levels of self-discipline, I guess, uh, when it comes to, uh, to these types of things. It needn't be unenjoyable. And of course, it's our job as a coach uh, to make it as enjoyable as possible. We must accept that we cannot always turn this into a, a playground for them. Um, we're talking about a defense here that's highly structured, highly rigid, and doesn't have any interpretation. And when you start saying those three things in the same sentence, enjoyment is very difficult to find. Probably I'm wrong. Um, yes, I think uh, in terms of softer coaching skills, anyone who has uh, a good understanding of uh, constraints led, uh, constraints led uh, coaching, small sided games as a as a, a practice, uh, constructivism, teaching games for understanding, any of these types of contexts where you're building the parameters uh, and you're feeding. Uh, your players into situations that allow them to uh, be autonomous, uh, to collaborate with the players next to them, uh, to find answers and to get enjoyment from finding those answers and celebrating with the players around them, then then you're on to a winner. And in, in the 3-2-1 defence, as rigid as it is, um, there are plenty of opportunities for this because as we know, handball is a, a very uncontrollable sport. Uh, and you will never have all of the answers to all of the questions. What 3 2 one defense is, is set up enough of the rules ahead of time so we don't have to then find out for new in a game situation, more so than a 6-0 defense, I would say. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not a one-size-fits-all. I do not coach kids the way that I coach adults 3 2 one and I do not coach stage one and two the way that I coach stage three and four. You can't do it because stages three and four require a level of autonomy that I cannot instruct. Um, the world is full of coaches who stand on the sidelines screaming the answers. And as good as this is, uh, well, I don't know if it's good, but as, as effective as this might be for a kid when he's 10 years old, and we might be more prepared to win by having somebody play PlayStation with us, um, it's not going to do much for their long-term development because one day you won't be there as the coach, and one day they're going to need to find an answer in that moment right there and then without the fortune of your voice uh, and they can only do this by living a situation where they're being allowed to make those level of decisions so if if, if you haven't done enough uh, or a lot of reading up on on different types of coaching uh, practices um, and approaches i would definitely recommend doing this because I, for one am very particular with the type of coaching that i'm i'm delivering at each stage of this timeline if you like okay scott um nice to to see your approach the to the continuum from democratic to autocratic uh, to fit fit the bill that you need um i think we need to wrap up we won't be able to open the the, the questions the live questions uh, unfortunately because there's time to time to go bobby uh, mentioned on the on the chat that if you want to leave your questions there obviously we're going to pass them on uh, and we, we'll contact you later on your on your email. We do apologize for that, but the fact is um, there's no practical time to carry on. In terms of uh, Scott's delivery, I would like to thank you uh, very much. I think it was brilliant, and and hopefully um, the coaches will take a lot uh, from it, um, and will 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 define something to apply from it as well. There's there's very good comments on, on the chat group. As we would expect, and we know you're, you, you will, you'd be the, the right guy to pass this message. So, on behalf I just, of can I just say one thing? Can yeah. I just say one thing before you close up, Ricardo? Firstly, um, the tactical stuff with this tactics board, I, I couldn't get it working for some reason, but um, what I'll do is I'll get all of this stuff gathered together and I'll send it over to Bob and Ricardo, specifically yeah. relating to things like uh, transition. How do I react to those changes? Uh, I'll, sorry, I wasn't in a position to be able to show practically the. Um, but I'll get this stuff over to England Handball and you can distribute it to the way that you want. The next thing, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel because it is awesome. <laughs> well, Scott, thank you very much, guys. I'll see you on Friday where we have a session on gamification. It will be very interesting as well. So, uh, yeah, stay safe and see you soon. Thank you. Take it easy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.